All right, line A1, learning task eight, we're gonna talk about features of inductors and particularly just the way that they go and create their values of voltage. There is also a very, very critical thing that you need to note about this learning task, eight, nine, and 10, is that we are gonna be missing some parts out of the formulas. There's just a misprint in a lot of the binders, not necessarily your binder, but most binders have this misprint and it's a Greek letter delta that is gonna be missing from lots of your different formulas. Once we hit that delta or where we need to have that delta, I'm gonna identify that for you. Once I've identified that for you, it's up to you to go and verify whether or not that's uh, gonna be a necessary part of your formulas from this point forward. So we will identify it inside the video, then I'm going to identify a couple places that I see throughout the text. If you have another place where you're certain that this is one that's missing a delta, just ask, you know, when we're on our live sessions, find out whether it's one that's going to be uh, missing. Okay, let's talk about induction. Induced voltage is what happens anytime that we are going to go and get Faraday's law, which we took a look at in the previous one, which is going to be that we've got B, L, and B. Flux density, length of active conductor, and velocity, or relative movement between the flux and the conductor, whether the conductor is moving past the flux or the flux is moving past the conductor. And we went through how we can go and increase, you know, the flux, or we could increase the length of the velocity, and that would give us an increase in the amount of voltage. This is ultimately all going to be called electromagnetic induction, where we're using magnetism and we're converting it into electricity. This is, you know, another one of our fundamental universal laws, you know, that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only go and change form. The module starts out over here by going and saying, hey, you should remember from, you know, level one about how to use your left hand rule. We did just go over this in the previous video, so you should be all right with this. Use your left hand rule for conductors. Stick your thumb in the direction of conductor on the, or direction of current on the conductor, and you should be able to identify the direction of rotating magnetic field. If you don't know what your direction of current is, you should remember dot and cross convention. Cross is going to be an arrow that is flying away from you. Imagine that that's this arrow. It's going to be the feathers on the back end of the arrow as it's flying away. Dot is going to be the very tip of the arrow coming towards you. So when I'm looking at a cross section of a conductor, if I see the dot, that's current coming towards me. If I see the cross, that is the current moving away from me. Use your left hand right now. Verify the direction of current are the direction of uh, magnetic flux that is around each of these conductors. It's relatively straightforward. Just curl your fingers around in the direction. Once that is established, we're gonna be able to move on to our next, uh, next section. The next section is gonna be talking about a change in current. What happens when the amount of current that is traveling through here goes and increases? Well, we know that any time that we get an increase in current, we are going to go and get an increase in the size of the surrounding magnetic field. And it starts from the very, very center. Every time there's a little bit of an increase in current, we're gonna go and generate another flux line. And that other flux line is going to go and push the other ones further out. Remember that lines of flux are elastic, which means that they want to contract as small as possible, but and they can never go and cross each other. So every time that I increase the amount of current going through this conductor, I'm just going to say that my amps are going up. As I do that, I'm going to be generating new lines. Each of these lines is going to push out and it's going to push this, for, this circle further and further out. We know that this magnetic line over here, the one that's on the very outside, is going to be stretched incredibly tight, right? Because we're going to be pushing it further and further. It's like taking any elastic. We know that it's going to go and have a lot more force than any lines that are going to be on the inside over here. Later on, we're going to go look at collapsing these back in and how we can utilize all of that force that's on the outside. Anytime that we increase the current, these magnetic lines of flux are going to be going and increasing, pushing further out. Anytime that we go and decrease the amount of current, they're going to be collapsing back inward and collapsing back inward like that, which means that ultimately they're going to be cutting back into our conductor itself. And as soon as they do that, we're going to be able to go and get this self-induction or self-induced voltage that we are going to go and generate back out of this. And what it's going to be is it's going to be a opposition that is going to be created inside of the conductor that is going to fight back against the change. It's never going to win, but it's always going to go and resist it. Let's take a look at this drawing that they show over here. Now I've put up a left hand uh, rule picture right beside it because we're going to use the left hand rule to go and analyze this thing. 
What we also have is we've got a dotted line that is drawn down the center. The reason for that dotted line is just so we delineate one side versus the other. It's really hard to think in a full 360 degree circle. It's much easier for our you know, uh, minds to just go and analyze only one half at a time. It operates the same all the way around, but we're only going to analyze a single half at a time. What we're going to do is we're going to go and apply this left-hand rule to this over here. And we're going to go and keep that center finger folded in because that's always, always, always the thing that we're going to be looking at last. Okay. Using our left-hand rule and working off of the dot and cross convention over here, you should be able to go and turn your thumbs so facing into the page. It's a little bit awkward. And you should be able to verify these direction of magnetic lines that's circling around the outside. If my current that is going through here is increasing, we know that there's going to be more and more and more lines of flux that are going to be pushing further out. And so that's where we get this little arrow over here that talks about the motion of our flux lines. Our flux lines are pushing out through the conductor, which would be the same if my flux lines are pushing out. It's the same thing as if my conductor were pushing into the flux. It's a little bit of just a, you know, uh, a viewpoint type of thing more than anything. You know, if you stand, if you're at a train crossing and you look directly in front of you, you see a train passing across. If you turn to one side, the train's gonna to appear to be coming towards you. If you turn towards the other side, the train's gonna to appear to be moving away from you. You're still in the same position. The train is still doing the exact same thing that it was, but it's all based upon the viewpoint. And what we need to take is we always need to take the viewpoint of our conductor because we know that our thumb is going to go and have the motion on our conductor that it's going to be looking at. So we look at the expanding lines of flux. Those expanding lines of flux are cutting through the outside of this conductor. I'm just going to highlight the outside ring of this conductor over here. So they're pushing out through the outside ring of that conductor as they go and do that. It's the same as if the conductor were being pushed back into these lines. Once we have that established, what we can do is we can now take our left hand rule and we can line it up with what we have over here. I'm going to take this left hand rule now it's hard to see on the, the picture over here, but I'm going to try to line this thing up. I'm going to go and take my first finger and put it in the direction of field. See these little arrowheads? That's my direction of field. So I'm going to go and line this one up over here. I'm going to go and line up this thumb over here and this thumb is supposed to be going in this direction over here so I don't know maybe I can tilt this one here just maybe a little bit more let's just grab that there and, and tilt a little bit more and then what I should be doing is I should be folding my center finger out and last of all and what I will see when I go and fold my center finger out towards myself is that there's going to be current a generated small amount of current that is going to be coming back towards me take your left hand Line up your first finger in this direction, pointing straight up towards you. Point your thumb across the page in that direction, right? Just line up like that. Now fold out your center finger. Your center finger should be pointing directly towards you, which shows you that there's going to go and be a counter EMF, a countering voltage that is generating a tiny amount of current that is going to be pushing back towards you. The same thing happens on the opposite side. It's more awkward to go and treat the opposite side with your left hand. You got to kind of either flip your arm around awkwardly or flip your page around. But if I go and flip around to this side, same thing. If I take a look, my lines of flux are expanding outwards, which would be the same as if my conductor were cutting inwards. And now, because we've got a circular magnetic field, my magnetic field is pointing downward. So I'm going to go and line those up. Here's my magnetic field pointing downward. Here's my motion on my conductor pointing inward. And if I fold out that center finger, once again, I'm going to go and see an induced amount of current that is going to be coming back in the opposite direction towards us. What is this going to do? Well, you remember vectors that we covered yesterday. Those vectors, we talked about how we have got direction and they represent magnitude, right? And when we looked at those two battery voltages that we had tied together, we said that we could go and have vectors that would cancel each other out, that would drop the overall amount of voltage that we would see off of something. We are going to go and get this over here, but you got to remember that these little green currents that we're establishing over here are generated off of this main current that is coming through here. That main current is never going to generate a large enough current that it's all that's going to be able to go and completely cancel it out. All that it's going to do is it is going to go and slow down that main current. 
reality, you could go and, you know, look at it as if it were a, uh, I don't know, I'm not really much of a, a sports person over here, but uh, in football, you got the, the hiker dude and then the big, um, the line, the linebacker guys over there. You can look at it as if you've got a big linebacker, which is going to be your main current over there. It's a big guy. And then as if you got a smaller linebacker, which is going to be this, this little green current over here. That smaller linebacker, I'll make him even tinier here. That little tiny linebacker over there is not going to go and stop the big linebacker, but he is going to go and slow down that big linebacker. is going to prevent that big linebacker from, you know, pushing his way all the way through right away. That's what we're getting over here with these self-induced voltages or this, in, uh, this counter EMF, where it is slowing down the rate of rise of voltage or the rate of rise of current that's going to be pushing through here. It is just a choking down type of effect. And we're gonna go and use that term, uh, a choke, when we start talking about a, react, a reactor or an inductor. Inductors come by a bunch of different names. Uh, reactors, chokes, and inductors are all terms that are gonna be used to go and describe these. Generally speaking, we use the term reactor when we're using them in motor control type of applications. We will use the term chokes when we are dealing with electronics. We'll use the term inductors when we're dealing with AC, but they're all the exact same thing. It's just different, you know, sectors of the industry that have taken to using different names for these. If you didn't get what was going on here with this creation of the self-induced voltage over here, pause at this point, go back through, just watch that again. You have to understand that Anytime that I get an increase in current, where my current is increasing outward around that conductor, it is going to be cutting through that conductor and thereby creating a self-induced amount of voltage inside there. What is it trying to do? Well, it's trying to prevent this current from changing. Remember how we said that the current was increasing? That's what was pushing the lines of flux out. If my lines of flux were not moving, if I'm no longer changing my value of current that is going through here, Will I have any more motion on my flux lines? Will I be creating new rings of flux and pushing them out? Absolutely not. I will have some lines of flux that are going to be going around the outside, around the outside over here, but those lines of flux are going to be a fixed number. I don't care. We call it 100 million of them right now. That 100 million lines of flux is all there is going to go and be. We're not increasing or decreasing. And that's what's happening anytime that we get ourselves to a steady value of current. But as soon as we start to go and drop our current, we're going to go and see a reversal of this entire process over here. The reversal that is going to go and happen is going to be that now if I start to drop the amount of current that's going through. So actually, why don't I just put up a little graph here on the top? We're going to go and call this axis over here amps. We'll call this one over here time. What we took a look at was we took a look at when we are increasing our amount of current over time and that we saw that we had that current that was going to be coming back towards us. I'm going to put a little dot underneath this graph just to represent that's what was happening. Then when we get to this point over here, we're going to go and say that now we're at a steady amount of current. When we get to a steady amount of current, we no longer have got any lines of flux that are pushing out. Therefore, we're not cutting through any of the conductor itself. Therefore, we're not inducing any values of voltage. So we are going to go and have no induced voltage or currents or anything like that. And now what we're going to do for our very last step over here is we're going to go and drop our value of current. If we drop our value of current, what's going to happen is all these lines of flux, that's still current in the same direction, okay? So we push all these lines of flux out. What's going to happen now is all these lines of flux are going to go and shrink back in, okay? They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller, which means that, I'm just going to go and wipe those ones out which means that now my motion of my flux lines are coming back in, which would be the same as if my conductor were pushing out of those. Same with this side over here, the motion of my flux lines are shrinking back in, which would be the same as if my conductor were pushing out on those. Just move a bunch of that as well. So what is this going to go and do? Well, we're gonna once again have induction, right? We have got lines of flux that are cutting through a conductor. Anytime that it happens, we do get induction. Let's go and analyze that. We're going to take a look at this side over here again, because that's the side that we started with last time. We'll use a blue marker this time. Has my direction of my field changed? Absolutely not. Has my direction of my um, thrust on the conductor changed? That has, because now it appears as if my conductor were pushing out. The lines of flux are collapsing back in. It's like my 
B or my conductor would be pushing back out. So I'm going to go and line up my left hand rule with this thing. I'm going to go and take my first finger in the direction of my field. I'm going to go and have my thumb in the direction of my thrust. Unfortunately, I can't do that on this one here right now, just because that picture is actually not going to go and flip around for me. Um, maybe can I rotate it? Eh, no, I don't think so. There's nothing that I said. That's a quick flip uh, option off of here. Whatever. We'll just ignore that picture. We'll do it ourselves manually with our left hand. Take your left hand, put your first finger in the direction of the field, pointing straight up like that. Take your thumb. Remember, we always do the finger gun first. Point your thumb out towards the left right now. And now point, unfold your middle finger. When you unfold your middle finger, you are going to go and see that it is now going to be driving current back in like that. You can do the same on the opposite side. It's a lot more awkward to go and do so. You can, but you can go and either flip the page around or you know flip your body around, twist whatever whatever you need to do. But you'll find out that doing that same analysis on this side shows that we are now going to go and be inducing a value of current that is going to go and once again be heading away from us. Compare that on this graph over here. If we take a look at this graph that we have in the upper right hand corner of your page or of your video right now, what you're seeing is that as the current was rising, as the circuit current was rising over here, that we were fighting against that rise. We were stuffing electrons back against it. Now, as the circuit current is falling, it is going to be generating. It's collapsing lines of flux back in onto itself and generating small amounts of current. It's as if this thing were slowing down. Let's go and take our, our linebacker guy right now. It's as if this linebacker were slowing down, but now we have got a little helper, I don't know, a mini linebacker of some sort that is helping to go and you know push him through there. We're getting this effect where we're opposing a change in current. And that's really the heart of what an inductor does. An opposer or an inductor just does not like change. It's a lot like you and I. Once it accepts the circuit current, it doesn't do anything, right? Once our circuit current is not changing, it just kind of lives with it and that's the way it is. When the current is increasing, it doesn't like it. It fights against it. When the current is decreasing, it doesn't like that either and it fights against that. And what it's using in both of these is it's using energy in the form of electromagnetic lines of force. It's going to create current based off of those electromagnetic lines. This is really, really critical for us that we understand that the inductor is only active on the two shoulders over here. When I've got a change in current going up, when I've got a change in current going down, that I never get any action out of that inductor when that inductor is at a flat line. Okay, let's talk about Lenz's law and how Lenz's law goes and applies to this. Uh, Lenz's law stated that the direction of the induced voltage so the generated voltage, this is talking about, you know, when we first create something off of BLV, the direction of generated voltage will be such that any current resulting from it will develop a flux that tends to oppose any change in the original flux. This is that whole counter EMF thing that we referred to in the previous video, but now we're actually going to explain. Lenz's law basically says when we create voltage, we also must create a counter EMF, the mini linebacker that is going to go and oppose any change in our current. All of these, you know, the, the size of the current that we are going to go and have inside of here is going to be based upon, once again, laws that we have. We've got a whole pile of formulas that you would have covered back in level one that would have dealt with magnetism. And they show us one inside of here right now. And I'm going to write out actually a second one that's going to go and correspond. This one over here, which is going to be Ni over... RM, you all remember what N and I and RMM mean inside of there, right? Hopefully. And then this one. Beta, which is going to be phi over top of area. Okay, what are these ones? This one over here is going to be for my actual Weber's, which is going to be the number of lines of flux that I'm going to have. A physical finite number of lines of flux. This is going to be a number of turns that I'm going to go and have. So I can define how many Weber's I'm going to have based upon the number of turns, as well as based upon the amount of current that I'm going to go and have through something. 
all over top of the reluctance, the magnetic opposition that I'm going to go and have based upon the type of material that I've got my coil wound around. Let me get that out there, reluctance. So Weber's are based upon my ampere turns over top of my reluctance. A lot of times we'll just see it you know, being stated as being Weber's are ampere turns. You know, we don't so much consider the reluctance that's going to be inside of there. I've got another formula that is then going to go and utilize Weber's. And that one is going to be this one over here that is going to be for Tesla's. And Tesla's are just going to be how dense my magnetic field is. And all I'm doing is I'm taking my Weber's and I'm putting those Weber's over top of my area. And the bigger the area that I put the Weber's over top of, the smaller the Tesla value, the smaller the area that I put my Weber's, my lines of flux over top of, the higher the Tesla value. And we know that ultimately this beta value over here is going to go and be part of this formula over here, Faraday's law. EG is equal to BLV. So what we see if we follow this through, and it's just a train of calculations, if I see an increase in the amount of current that is going through my conductor, I'm going to go and see an increase in the amount of flux that I'm going to go and have. If I see an increase in the amount of flux that I'm going to go and have, I'm going to see an increase in the amount of flux density that I'm going to go and have. And if I see an increase in my flux density, then I'm going to go and see an increase in the amount of voltage. In other words, the size of the voltage that is going to be generated is going to be directly related to the rate of change of the current. The faster that my current is changing, the faster that I'm going to go and change this and the faster that I'm going to go and change my value of voltage. We're going to go and put that all into a formula here in a second. Uh, but before we do that, we're just going to go and define what this voltage is, this generated voltage that we're talking about. We have got this generated voltage that is going to be based upon uh, all of this interaction inside of here, we call this thing the counter EMF. And the counter EMF is what created either the little bits of aiding current in this case or the little bits of opposing current that we had there before. Self-inductance is just going to be an inherent property of any circuit, any circuit that has got a wire in it. Uh, it's a property of a circuit that opposes any change in current in that circuit. So we have this that's constantly at work all around. That's why st uh, components that are made out of many turns of wire, you know, transformers and motors, for those of you that have ever wondered about that, that's why they aren't seen as short circuits because we're gonna have the self-inductance that we're gonna be able to go and strengthen and it's gonna fight back against any sort of voltage applied and that's what prevents these things from acting as short circuits. Let's talk about the unit for inductance. The unit for inductance is gonna be the Henry. Uh, the Henry is going to be abbreviated with a H and a circuit is considered to have an inductance of a Henry when a change in current of one amp produces a change in total flux linkages of one Weber. So if one amp changes my total amount of flux by one Weber, either increases or decreases it, that I'm going to go and have. This can also be rewritten as an electric circuit as an inductance of one Henry when a current changing at a rate of one amp per second induces a voltage of one volt into that circuit. Once again, the letter of the, the whole law, the way it's written like that, isn't as important as the formula that it derives. And this is the formula that is screwed inside of you guys' uh, for, uh, books over there. So follow along with this one. Let's fix this one now. And then hopefully it doesn't screw you up too bad with a bunch of the other stuff that's inside of here. Once again, during our live sessions, if you've got questions about whether it's a screwed formula or not, uh, identify which one it is and you know which page and which topic it's under and I can quickly look it over and talk to you about that one. This is the way that the formula is supposed to go and look. E is equal to negative L delta I over top of Delta T. Delta is a Greek letter. It's the Greek letter D. And what it represents is change. We always see the, or this delta being used whenever we have got a change. So the way that the formula looks inside of your book here right now doesn't make much sense because it says that, you know, the counter EMF is going to be based upon the current over top of the time uh, multiplied by my inductance in Henry. What we need to have is we need to have that this is a change in voltage or a change in time that we are going to go and have. Let's go through what this formula has. First of all, uh, this L over here is going to be the inductance of the circuit measured in Henry's. 
That's Henry's value that we are going to have. We're going to multiply that Henry's value by the change in current over top of the change in time. Now, my change in current can be a rise in current over a short amount of time. It could be a fall in current over top of a short amount of time. Whatever it's going to be is going to go and determine what my multiplier is for my Henry. So I'm going to go and multiply that together. And then this is super critical, this negative. That negative means that we are going to go and have an opposition. It just shows us that we have got an opposing value of voltage. We're going to go and use this formula heavily inside of our next next cell test, uh, or sorry, our next learning test that we are going to have. But for now, just correct it inside of this one. And then we're anytime that you see that formula in the other ones, it is missing these deltas over here. Okay, let's talk about inductors. We'll come back to that uh, formula when we need to go and utilize it. Uh, let's talk about an inductor itself. An inductor is simply going to be something that has been built to go and maximize the amount of self-inductance or the amount of opposition to current change that we are going to go and have. Usually what we do is we take wire and we wind it together into a tight coil. The tighter the coil that we are going to go and uh, Put together the more inductance that we are going to go and have out of it because the more magnetic lines of flux that it's going to be able to go and link across from one to another right instead of us just looking at a oops, sorry at a single set of lines of you know current going through now we've got lines of current coming from other ones that are pushing back through in the opposite direction so it's going to go and increase the total amount of inductance our simplest inductor is just a straight line any wire always has some self-inductance. It's relatively low. Usually we go and ignore that. In some high frequency applications, we will worry about it. Uh, and for people that are utilities like hydro, they will also worry about it because they're looking at the losses across the entire province. So they do need to go and you know, keep, keep a hold of however many losses they have, etc. Our inductors are going to be wound around different types of components based upon the application we're going to go and use them in. Air core inductors are going to be just coils of wire that are going to go and be formed. Here's our symbol for one. Uh, coils of wire that are going to be formed around usually a plastic spool. And then it's just going to have air through the center. The reason that we use these is be any place that we have got high shred losses. You should have covered in your AC theory back in level one, skin effect, hysteresis, radiation, any current, and dielectric losses. If you don't know those losses, why don't I just write them down here? Is that beginning of second year after all so let's make sure we got it defined early on skin effect it's a type of loss where we drive all of our current towards the outside edge hysteresis this is going to go and be a lagging effect that is going to go and happen inside of cores magnetic cores radiation this is going to be lines of flux that are going to escape our circuit and then we travel out to the universe somewhere, cut through something and induce heat there, but it's still a loss from our circuit. Eddy currents are going to be circulating currents that are going to be set up inside of our coils, our inside of our cores. And then dielectric losses, which are going to be losses inside of our insulation. All of these losses over here, and we use the acronym SHRED for them, uh, all of these losses are going to increase any time that we see an increase in frequency or we see an increase in voltage. So our air core inductors are going to be used in any places where we have got high frequency or high voltage because they would just have too big of a set of losses otherwise. Iron core inductors are going to go and have iron or steel. Oftentimes it's going to be a powdered iron or steel that's going to be bonded together in epoxy. It makes it really easy for manufacturing. They just kind of like take powdered steel, they mix it in with epoxy, and then they just squirt it into a mold. And once it's inside of the mold, the epoxy hardens up and they can get it in any shape without having to do any sort of machining. Um, they're going to go and have what we refer to as ferrite cores. And we'll go and use a special type of wire. It's called magnet wire. It's just got some different... It's the way that the insulation is done off of it, the actual physical properties, the thermal expansion, it's all just a little bit different than our regular building copper wire. So it's designed to be wrapped around these ones. We'll use these things anytime that we've got low frequency, under like 100 hertz and below. We consider that to be relatively low frequency. The last one that we are going to go and have is going to be our variable 
inductors. The variable inductors are going to allow us to change the amount of inductance that we are going to have. Usually what we are going to do is we are going to go and change the core. It's the easiest thing for us to go and do is change what the core of that inductor is. And the most common way that it's going to be done is if I have got a core, we'll just draw this as a core over here. What I'll do There's my inductor is I'll just drift that core out of there. As I drift that core out of there, now I'm going to have part of my core that's going to be made up of air, which has got a high reluctance, and part of that core that's going to be made up of iron, which has got a low value of reluctance. And as a result of that, it's going to change the overall permeability of my core. Uh, I take it out. I'm going to go and lower my amount of inductance. I push that core all the way back in. It's going to go and raise that type of inductance or the amount of inductance that I'm going to have out of it. They are used all over the place. To give a couple examples, you know, not stuff that's so pertinent to us. They talk about welding machines uh, that they are sometimes use to adjust the amount of uh, output current on some of our older style welding machine. They talk about tuners and radio receivers. We don't use them as commonly in radio receivers as we use them in industrial instrumentation. We do use a lot of inductive sensors inside of industrial instrumentation that is going to be using tuned loops you know detectors that are there to go and detect you know small bits of metal inside a lumber as it's going through a lumber mill or to go and detect weights or detect proximities and things like that so we do use them heavily inside of the instrumentation which is going to be all the sensors inside of our electrical field we do also have another one that is going to be called a saturable reactor that we're able to go and utilize to change the amount of inductance without having to move anything. It's wonderful because we're just going to use a DC coil to partially lock up the core. We'll lock up some of those magnetic domains inside of the core by using some DC on the same core as our AC section. All three of these inductors are going to be recognized by this little little symbol over here it's going to be showing just a couple of uh, turns is what we go and call that if it's got the iron core it's going to go and have those double bars anytime that we see an electrical component that's got an arrow through it it usually means that it's going to be variable in this case absolutely that means that this is a variable type of inductor okay the very last part is where we're going to take a look at our formula for inductance this one is also on your ITA sheet this one is a critical one that is going to be used in second year as well as it's going to be used in third year. In other words, don't forget this once we finish, you know, this section, we're going to go and use it through the first couple of self, uh, well, I guess through the first couple of chapters here inside of second year and then heavily inside of third year as well. But it's going to be this one over here, L, the physical build of an inductor is based upon my N squared. That's going to be the number of turns squared multiplied by the permeability that I am going to go and have of my core material multiplied by the area of my core all over top of the length of the core itself. Now this length of the core is in meters so it's going to be a tiny little thing. Most of these inductors are small, way smaller than like a closed fist type of idea. The values that we see off of here are all physical values. They're all based upon build. Length is a physical value. This area inside of square meters, cross-sectional area, is going to be a physical value. Permeability is going to be a physical value based upon the type of material that's used. N is going to be a physical value based upon the number of turns. Looking at our variable inductor, we see why we use you know, this variable core because it's really impractical. If we need to change the inductance, it's impractical to have to add or remove turns from an inductor. It's impractical to have to go and change the area. What we're talking about is a cross-sectional area. So what I've got my turns wrapped around, it would be really, really hard to go and increase the size of that core inside of there, somehow like make it larger and thicker, because doing so we would have to somehow get stretchy wire. It doesn't exist, so we don't use that. And we don't really change the length. The length sometimes has been changed in some of them, but it's pretty uncommon that we're going to go and change the length. Once again, if we're looking at a variable inductor, the most common thing that we are going to go and see is that that variable inductor is going to go and have a core that we can go and drift out of that thing. I'm drawing this thing poorly, but whatever, we'll, we'll make it work over here. As I drift that core out of this inductor, I'm going to have more air, less iron. Therefore, my permeability would be going down. As soon as I push this core back in, my permeability is going to go back up once again. 
They'd show two more uh, formulas once again at the very end of this one here as well. They're going to go and use the Weber's one as well as the magnetic reluctance one. The RM is going to be equal to L over top of permeability and area. And my Weber's is going to be both uh, based upon my ampere turns divided by my reluctance that I'm going to go and have. And they just use those two formulas to show that, look, if we decrease the amount of reluctance, then we are going to go and increase the amount of flux that we are going to go and have through there. And if we increase the length, then we're going to increase our reluctance, which is going to go and decrease our amount of flux. It just shows where the relationship is between each of these, the permeability and the length, when it comes to this formula itself. Okay, that covers us off here for the basics of what an inductor is. It's a little bit uh, nutty, you know, at first when you're looking at this, particularly this whole concept of self-inductance, you know, where it's cutting through that outside ring of the conductor as it's cutting through, it's either going to be creating a current that's in opposition or that's going to be aiding it, depending on whether my current is increasing or decreasing. But you need to have this because what we're going to do is we're going to move directly from inductors in DC, which is the next topic we're going to cover, we're going to move into inductors in AC, and then we're going to go and take inductors in AC, and we're going to convert those into transformers. And then we're going to take in third year, we're going to take a transformer, and we're going to start to make it rotate. That's going to be what we refer to as an electric motor. So this over here is so, 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 so critical that you get this at this point because you are going to use this foundationally to go and build transformers and motors and build that theory. If you don't get this now, you're going to struggle with those other components later on. Okay, we will move on to the next one now.